Hey, uh, today we are going to talk about how do we come up with that number in grade list. So for me in Ontario, I have to legally give you a number at midterms and at finals. And those are the only two times I legally have to give you numbers. So these are the only time that you'll see numbers from me when you are a student. And uh, this can be a bit of a controversial thing because to be honest with you, every teacher will have their own way of coming up with a number in the end. For me, I actually have the students come up with their own number. And I think that's where the controversy comes from because people are like, but but how do you have students come up with their own mark in their course? Don't they all ask for 98? And the answer is no, they don't. Because if you tell them they have to have sufficient evidence to support what number they're going to ask for, you'll actually find a lot of them self-report pretty accurately. So there's data studies on this one. About 90% of students will self-report right in where they should be. About 5% will overinflate and 5% will underinflate. And so that just drives some of your conversations. I have had students overinflate by a lot before. And and then when I start saying, okay, so show me the evidence about why you think you deserve this number, they can't back it up. And then like, oh, actually, no, you're right. I think this is actually where I'm at. And then that ends up being reasonable. One thing I will give a heads up on, I had a teacher colleague ask for a number, like specifically like a, a one number, and that ended up being really hard. I asked my students for a level range. So for example, a four to four plus, a three minus to three. So basically you're looking at like a 5% window and that's where I overlap with students quite a bit. So what I end up doing about a week before midterms and a week before finals, I'll have students hand this document in to me for me to take a look at. So um, I encourage students to work through this through the entire year. I'll often encourage them to record into their portfolios or record their evidence so that when it comes time to actually justify, they've got everything they need. So I have students either use the portfolio tool built into places like Brightspace or through um, other options. Uh, we use D2L Brightspace in our board. So this is a nice, easy portfolio option that's attached to our classrooms that I can have access to and students will tag. Um, another option that I'll have often students do if you're more of a Google-fied thing is they will have kind of the links over here and then they will take images of their evidence as they go through so they can record the evidence and just kind of look, upload images to trigger their thinking about this is where I showed this. And then at midterm time, what they do is they're going to fill this document out. So some of them will write paragraphs, some of them will hyperlink over to their portfolios or to their other documents. Some of them will just do bullet points and they'll basically say, okay, I deserve this level and here are the reasons why I deserve this level. When you get to this level component, I always have a discussion with my students um, around midterm time and we take kind of your continuum of from beginning to mastering and we kind of throw the levels on. Okay, so if you are asking for a level three, where should you be on this continuum pretty consistently? And so that's where uh, they tend to, that's kind of the conversation we have. And then the students will then report, okay, I deserve a level three and this is the evidence of where, or I deserve a level four because I've been doing really well here, but I still have some gaps here and that kind of stuff. And it provides some really good conversations. Um, it provides really good evidence when it comes to like report card comments. And then after that, uh, they hand these in. And then I take a look at them really quickly and then I have one-on-one -on -one interviews with them. So I'll block out a day. Um, in online land, it takes longer because you're doing like 15 minute blocks with them. So I actually try to block them over three days because two days was really tight because 15 to 17 meetings a day is a lot. Um, but it can happen. And so basically you'll just have one-on-one -on -one chats with the kids. So typically at this point, I'll be assigning like a, a work on their own summative or something in class. I'll have them working on some kind of like thinking task or something where I don't need to like be really actively supervising them and then just pull them out in the halls and having conversations one-on-one. -on -one. If a student is really far off on their mark ask, I'll ask them, for example, okay, so you're asking for a 90 here. I wasn't quite there. Can you show me the evidence as to why you think you deserve a 90? And then as they start digging through, and finding there isn't enough evidence to justify that 90, they'll end up backing down and you'll end up on the same page. So I have found this super, super efficient. It's really good because it really helps the students in terms of their independence, ownership of their learning, ownership of their thinking. And you don't have that like argument at the end of the year about like, why didn't you give me a 98 when I needed a 98? It's like, no, I didn't give you a 98. You didn't give yourself a 98 because you didn't actively pursue that 98 or demonstrate or work hard enough or learn enough to get that 98. So it's really nice. It takes the pressure off you as a teacher, which is lovely, um, really reflects like self-advocacy, which is more reflective of the real world. And overall, I have found this to be like a really awesome system.